Welcome to the Inside Bassmaster Podcast presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company, episode 123. And this is the Lake Murray Recap, Santee Cooper Lakes Preview. I'm your host as usual, Ronnie Moore, my co-host, like always, my guy Kyle Jesse. And Kyle, what a great event we had at Lake Murray, man. We talked about it and we said that it was going to be a great event. It was going to be a fish catching event, that there was a lot of things that could happen. And boy, we, we couldn't have picked a better person to preview the event with than Patrick Walters. He broke it down for us and followed it up with a fourth place finish on his behalf. But man, Lake Murray showed out 87 pounds even to win the event. You had nine guys average 20 pounds for the whole week, four days, and they had over 80 pounds. Incredible week of fishing and uh, not too shabby for fantasy fishing. We'll get into how we did there, but I made a little bit of a comeback. But overall, Drew Benton. Your champion of Lake Murray, what a great event, especially to see it all unfold on Bassmaster Live. Yeah, no question. I mean, Mark Zona said it best on Bassmaster Live. I guess it was on Sunday. Uh, typically, when you go into these, these tournaments, you know, when you ask guys what it's going to be like, you know, they're all reserved. They're like, I don't know. It's going to be tough. It's not going to be very good. There was nobody saying that before the start of this tournament. I mean, I think everybody was in understanding whether or not you were on something extremely good or not, that everybody was going to catch them. And uh, they certainly did that. And like you said, um, having Patrick Walters on the podcast uh, to preview the event was perfect because I was thinking as I was watching live all week, basically everything he said came to fruition. So uh, it was certainly a good preview and I hope we have a good preview for Santee Cooper as well. Yeah, to see so many different, the word of the week was spawn because there was a bass spawn, there was a shad spawn, there was a blueback herring spawn, and then John Cox was trying to force a bluegill spawn that was about to pop up probably in the next week or so, but everything in nature was 10 feet or less, it seemed. And that's where the ecosystem was. All the forage that bass could want, the bass themselves were there. And it was kind of just a perfect storm. And what was cool was there wasn't a certain region of the lake you needed to be in. There were so many points, so many areas all across Lake Murray from Drear Island State Park all the way to the dam. Any point that you pulled up on could be the point that you catch 25 pounds on. And we saw that so many, so many different ways. And if we go into the final day and how that transpired, to think of Drew Benton being second place after day one, he takes the lead going uh, after day two. And going into day three, he in, he then struggles, has 14 pounds and drops to 10th, last man in championship Sunday, and then vaults from 10th to first, making up a five-pound difference over Kyoya Fujita, who was your leader going into the day. To see that happen and the biggest bag of the tournament on the final day was super cool. And Drew mentioned it. He had two things going on that final day. He did get on a shad spawn or, or some kind of bait fish spawned whether there was some herring mixed in there as well and that Brock Mosley gave him kind of a hat tip in the in the um, uh, bag line the day before before everyone was cut and eliminated which is totally legal they're just chit-chatting back and forth behind the behind the the tanks and and he gets a little help on how to catch fish in the first two hours of the day so Benton then goes catches two two or three key fish in the morning has a limit and then goes the rest of the day only needing two or three sight fish. And boy, did he find the right ones. In the last hour, you find a six and you find a five and you get him to bite and you land him. Couldn't have been a more perfect final day for Drew Benton. Yeah, no question. You know, it was actually funny. I got a, a sneak peek at the uh, top lures gallery uh, that'll go up on Tuesday morning, of course, on Bassmaster.com. But I was sitting there looking at the uh, the gallery and I noticed in Benton's, uh, you know, the baits he showed, he didn't show the crankbait. Because when those photos were taken, he probably had no earthly idea that that was going to work out like it did. Um, so for like you said, for him to be able to go and catch some early fish, um, and he he shout out to Brock Mosley on live. It's not like he didn't give him credit. He obviously gave him some credit for helping him out there. Um, you know, to be able to find that or figure that out in you know such a short amount of time. The the thing is too, you know. He can tell him what to do, and that's fine and dandy, but it's like the saying always goes, it's hard to catch somebody else's fish. So for him to go have confidence to put that out on the line, knowing that in 10th place you have nowhere to fall, like you might as well go give it a shot. Then he catches, what, two or three big ones doing that. Um, Really a pretty crazy adjustment to make. And then, you know, based on the way things went on day three when Benton was having, you know, a more difficult time finding those sight fish, those bigger than average size fish up spawning, when he went and started doing that later in the day, you kind of started thinking, ah, 
I don't know. I mean, they weren't there yesterday. I don't know what would make him be there today, um, even if he's fishing different areas. And then sure enough, you know, he catches like a six pounder doing it. And then the the late day call that, you know, we put on uh, social media this morning that I know you got to see as well um, happen. And it's just like, man, what a picture perfect day. And I, I, I think that something that needs to be mentioned, this is something I almost texted you about yesterday and I completely forgot. You know, I think one thing that didn't get mentioned a lot was just a few weeks ago, Drew Benton was up on the classic stage knowing that he had lost his opportunity and lost his chance to win the classic there on the final day with Gussie stumbling and everything um, and him having some missed fish late in the day. And it just seemed like things didn't go his way. And, you know, he was up on the classic stage and said that, you know, God's timing is perfect. And obviously you, you know, you can't, you know, get in the way of that. Uh, and then now just a few short weeks later, this obviously works out the way it does for him to have a slow day three, like the worst bag of anybody in the top 10 over the course of four days. And then on the final day of the tournament, catch the biggest bag of the tournament and come back and win. So uh, it really is crazy the way things happen. And it made for a super, super entertaining event. I, I actually called Drew Benton last night when I, I kind of timed it up and was like, he should be driving to Santee Cooper right now. And so I called him. He was in the truck driving. And we talked about that, that, you know, just the close calls and the classic, you know, and then all of a sudden you think you lose the tournament, even though everyone in the top 10 had a shot to win. The fact that your rock solid, consistent pattern from day one and two failed you on day three. Well, I mentioned it on live with Mark Zona. Uh, Zona was like, you know, thank goodness Brock Mosley talked to him. And I was like, honestly, Z, thank goodness Benton struggled because I, if I'm in the back of the tanks and I got 23 a day and I'm still the leader, I'm not going to listen to somebody who just got cut and what they did. But when you need a bone throw your, thrown sure. your way and, and somebody lends some advice, you take it. And uh, Benton said to me on the phone that, dude, I caught a couple good ones that morning. He said, if I told you there were 50 big ones swimming around on any one of those shad spawn points that I went to, I would be underestimating how many big ones were there how because the water was so clear you can see these fish you can see the the big gray silhouettes swimming around when it's a school of wolf pack or a blueback herring school that they're darting through the fact that there were that many big ones laid up in the post spawn who would have thought 22 a day basically would win a post spawn event with all the pressure the lakes received absolutely incredible and so Congratulations to Drew Benton on winning that man. I thought Hunter Shrock had a really, really good shot. What a! It was one of those things where when he lands that six fourteen under the dock with his spinning rod and has to put it around the pole. If you haven't seen that, go to the Fish Catch of the Year candidate on YouTube or the website. That's what we named it because it was it was like Lee Livesey in twenty nineteen at the St. Johns River with the dock catch and putting his rod over and and getting that all that stuff. Absolutely unreal. And for it to work out for Hunter Shrog that morning and to land that fish and he was fired up and he was making the right decisions. I said, things like that happen when it's your time. And, and it was probably his time until noon. And then the last three hours was Drew's time because it was just incredible. Every time we'd be like, okay, the fishing has settled down five pounder from somebody six pounder from Ben. And you're like, any one, there was four or five guys that if they caught the right fish or two, which was very doable, they could win the event in the last hour. I've never seen that many guys in contention to win an event re realistically in the last hour of the tournament. So it was very cool. The top five from that event, Drew Benton, uh, Hunter Shryock, Kyoya Fujita, Patrick Walters, John Cox, and then uh, the rest from there. So what a great top five. We saw all kinds of patterns with from those guys and Overall, you got to watch it as a fan. You don't get to see the show. How entertaining was those were those four days? And for us to have five and a half hours on Fox Sports One on the championship Sunday, I don't know if we could have had a better fish catching day with only 10 anglers out there for that long a coverage. That is longer than any football game, plus the pre-shows, plus the post shows. I mean, that is a long, long broadcast, and it was action-packed the whole time. Yeah, no question. Like you said, um, I don't get to typically enjoy the live anymore. I obviously worked with you guys there in Little Rock for uh, you know, two and a half years or so, but um, doing what I do now, I typically travel to all the tournaments and shoot on the water, which like you said is great, but it's also bad in the sense that you're getting to see a few guys a day and what they're doing, but watching live, you get a full you know scope of what's going on. And I, there couldn't have been 
in a better tournament to watch live and not be on the water because it was like everybody was catching him. I mean, you could watch one guy all day long and he would catch him, but it was like there was never, you know, there's there's times in those tournaments, you know, for you guys at JM where it's hard to keep up with all the catches because there's so oh, many yeah. of them. And that was like what this tournament was. I mean, you could, you had to justify what you were going to show and what you weren't. It was like, well, if that's a two pounder, like can't show that guys are catching threes and fours right now. Um, we didn't where, even show, you know, we didn't even show. Like, I like Jason Williamson had a five pounder in the last six minutes of our show. And we didn't even get to show that because we were like, we got to get out. We got to, the show's ending. We got to, we got to say, yeah. see you later to everybody. Yeah. And, and there was, you know, and, and half the time we'd be going to a commercial break and there would be someone hooked up and we'd have to show it later, but it had been on Bass Track for two or three minutes. And we're like, we're trying to live in the present and it is just happening everywhere. You can't show them without interrupting them hardly. Yeah, it was, it was a fantastic tournament as far as that goes. And then also, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot on the podcast. Y'all talk about it a lot on live, but naturally you want tournaments where there's a lot of things going on. I mean, like you said, just in the last day alone, you had guys catching spawning fish, you know, sight fishing for them. Blueback herring fish was a huge thing, naturally. Everybody kind of knew that was going to be the deal. Chad spawn fish. And then, like you said, the last day we developed a, a bluegill spawn with John Cox that, like, nobody see, you know saw coming. That's something you'd see more towards May and, and even early June. And, uh, you know, it was just crazy because everybody was doing something a little bit different. And most guys were doing a little bit of all of it, which made it even more entertaining because it's like you never knew if – you know, like Brandon Cobb on the last day, being a, a more or less kind of a local and having so much experience with that, fished offshore and fished the blueback stuff most of the time. But then later in the day, you see him slide up to the bank and start fishing, you know, docks with a wacky worm and stuff. It was it was just really incredible because you couldn't blink without, you know, like you, if you blink, you didn't know what was going to like be on the screen the next time you look because something different was happening pretty much all the time, it seemed like. Yeah, we were trying to keep up with Bass Track and and deciphering who's low and how much they're low. I knew Hunter was probably more accurate when Drew said, you know, on live that his smallest was a four and he had two three and a halfs on Bass Track. I was like, okay, well, he's at least a pound low. And then when he no longer had those three and a halfs, I'm like, does he actually have fours? And so it was a fantastic week and uh, super excited about that. I will say this. We'll get into it when we do fantasy, but I had first, fourth, fifth and sixth for drain the lake so your boy is back i'm excited my rapala now you're gonna talk about that because i'm never i'm not back and I, I we don't i don't forecast me being back in that very soon um now we come to santee cooper back-to-back -back events these guys are tired i'm exhausted all the coverage everybody's rolling into a practice day on monday tuesday wednesday and then we're gonna have the tournament on thursday we're gonna have our guest join us from the water in just a moment but to kind of outline it just vaguely, not as many spawning fish probably as we saw last time in March. We're a little later in late April. We should see the shad spawn for sure. We should see just fishing down the bank. There should be a lot of fish shallow. I could see some post-spawn fish that are in brush piles or something like that for people. The word is on the street there's more eelgrass at Santee Cooper than ever you know, in recent memory there. So that can help uh, some guys and some of my fantasy picks maybe depending on that as well. But Kyle, let's get our guest on the podcast today, Bassmaster Elite Series Pro, Jonathan Kelly. And you might be wondering why we're having a guy from Pennsylvania join us as a guest for Santee Cooper Lakes. But he went to Coastal Carolina, just up the street, uh, and Jonathan is joining us from the water. As Ronnie mentioned, we have Jonathan Kelly here on the podcast. Jonathan may be the only guy we've ever had on here twice. Is that true, Ronnie? Or He's got to be one of the very few that's been on the Inside Bassmaster podcast twice in just a short amount of time maybe one of two or three guys three times actually he snuck in your iCast one when you were live from <laughs> iCast down there That's and then right. and then he was in studio with me when he came to visit Arkansas and now um and rightfully so Jonathan you 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 didn't grow up in this area but you grew up as a fisherman in this area college fishing meant a lot to you and you did a lot of your learning and work here talk to us about Santee Cooper you guys are halfway through your first day of practice and what are you seeing out there what do you expect is it is it going to just be like it normally is in a smash fest yeah it feels bad when you say it's halfway through the first day of practice time is flying by already <laughs> so it's uh, already scratching the head a little bit but you know it's early we still have like you said two and a half days left just trying to kind of get a clue we're at that weird time of the year 
right now on a lake like this. You know, I, I know we can't really base it off of what we've seen last week on Murray. You're talking two completely different lakes. You're talking a deeper, a very deep lake out there at Lake Murray in a lot clearer water than here. This is a super shallow lake. So I know a lot of fish came off beds last year in this tournament here, but think back, what was that, about five weeks ago? Or how, like, uh, so we're here much later this year. It's not going to fish on bed at all because there's a lot of fish in this lake. So there's definitely a good chance. Now, what I'm trying to do this morning is trying to find where there's more than just one. So far, uh, I've had four bites this morning and nothing's really told me anything. They've all been by themselves and two of them were shallow and two of them were out deeper. So it's like maybe there's fish everywhere kind of thing, which might not be a bad thing. It might spread some boats out and you, you'll see guys fishing a lot more and won't be bumping into each other. Jonathan, I think you kind of mentioned it there, but one of the things we talked about before you hopped on with us was the was the spawning fish. I think that, you know, like you said, you can't compare it entirely to Murray, but even at Murray, there was probably more spawning fish than a lot of people, you know, were giving credit to. Do you think that there's a chance, you know, somebody will surprise, you know, at least for a day or two with spawning fish? Because, you know, I mean, obviously I assume these fish will still be coming up in, you know, maybe some of the later waves. Yeah, I think there's always a chance. I mean, like, you can say it's late already, but you could also say it's still kind of early. You know, I'm sure there's always that last wave to go. Maybe the whole big last wave already went, but I'm sure there's still some stragglers held back. One of the fish I did catch this morning, I want to call it a pre-spawner. It's hard to tell sometimes. It really is. Sure. But I'm going to call the one I did catch this morning a pre-spawner. That's always encouraging. So oh, it, it could happen. What do you see in water temps wise? I know water temps are just a vague way. Once we get to the spawn, I no longer care about water temps, but is it a lot warmer mm -hmm. than you'd expect? Or is it a pretty normal temp with the low temperatures in the, in the, at nights lately for South Carolina? It was a lot warmer than I expected first thing this morning. It was when I put the boat in the water at 630, it was already 70. And I felt like we had a cooler night last night at cool cold or anything but cooler it wasn't by any means warm you weren't walking out in shorts and a t-shirt this morning and then i did just know you know going back to last week at murray every morning a lot of guys are bundled up in jackets so we've had cooler weather so to see 70 first thing in the morning and knowing how shallow this place is like if you had high sun days you'd see 80 degree water temperatures for the end of april that's pretty high in my opinion at least so it's it's crazy how fast I feel like this year started to pick up after everyone was saying it was a slow year to get kind of the spring going and kind of getting that first warm up. You know, we kind of missed out on a lot of those big waves of fish, I feel like, on a lot of tournaments that we fish because of the way the weather's been. Now, there has been a lot of bed fish caught for sure in our events so far, but you know what I mean? Like, we just haven't had you know, I feel like that big wave like we've seen last year when we were here, that was truly something incredible. And I think that was probably the best week of fishing on this entire lake last year for the entire year. Jonathan, we're, you know, we're going to get into fantasy fishing picks here in a little bit when we, uh, when we let you go, just for the, the viewers, maybe guys trying to pick their teams for this week. What are some other things we can maybe expect? Obviously we've talked about the spawning fish, um, you know, what are some of the other things that you're kind of expecting without giving too much away as far as, you know, shad spawn, bluegill spawn, offshore? What what do you see possibly playing? I think it like, you know, this time of the year, I think all those things can play. You know, I feel like there should be a shallow bite really well just because what should be shallow? The shad should be shallow. The bluegill should be shallow. And then you also incorporate the bedding fish. So you would think the large majority of the fish would be shallow, but you can never rule away some of those deeper and offshore fish, especially now, like like I said, we were here over a month ago when it was last year's tournament, and look how many fish were on bed. So just think if that happened this year, those fish are already well pulled out doing their post spawn things. So it can go either way for fantasy-wise. And if I was picking, I would definitely be picking, I hate to say it, but a live scoper because you just you have to put that in perspective that that happens nowadays on any lake we go to. and one of those guys that's really good at it, uh, those Japanese anglers, they might do something a little different than you'd expect to see here. And I don't know if it'll work or not, but there's always that thing to consider that it could happen. 
This will be your second Elite Series event here, our third in the last three and a half seasons or so calendar calendar wise. Uh, but you had fished here in college, and it's it's a lake that's nearby Winya Bay, which is where Coastal Carolina is on the coast of South Carolina. What have you learned, and what did you learn in college about Santee Cooper that helps you in an elite event? Obviously, time of the year is different. Those fish that spawn, they may pull up in the same areas, different times of year, whatever the case may be. But at least knowing the regions of the lake, because there are some famous creeks that we know, and they'll show up at certain times of the year, and then regions of the lake are non-players. They'll show up at different times of the year. So is there anything that you can take away from past history here that kind of cuts down your learning curve this time, or get you in high percentage areas? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely target the high percentage areas. I think the biggest factor this week is the water's up on both lakes, you know, a lot more than we saw it last year. So that kind of proves a curveball into my game plan. Like when I came to pre-practice a while back, the water was very, very low. Uh, so I kind of had an idea going in exactly what I wanted to do. And then I saw a few weeks ago the water spiked and I was like, uh-oh, like that's completely changing my outlook you know it's now putting water in an area that there has not been water in a long time and i know they've kept this lake down for quite a while now going back the last year or two and now that we're here with it being higher water there's areas i haven't seen the last two or three years that i've been here because you know you couldn't get to them now today i actually poked into one or two to just see you know just get back there see what the water quality is uh the vegetation that might have grown since the last time I've been in there and that I think that's the big x factor is what can be what can show up that you didn't see play last year I think that's the biggest thing there there's a lot of this lake available now that wasn't available last year just based off the water level I think the biggest thing for me like with a little bit of an experience here just through fishing in school is I expect the grind I, I know that this place is a grind I know it, it always looks great on paper uh everyone you know, not everyone, but a lot of guys catch them. And it's it's everywhere we go. But here especially, there's some monster bags that come out of here. But you don't get to see the behind the scenes as a viewer. And this place is every bit of a grind. It's three days of tough practice to just hope to try to come across one, maybe have a second area where you can really get on them and put, you know, three to four days worth of fish in the boat. So going into it, like, I don't expect be a smash fest even last year i didn't either i kind of had you know that mentality knowing that it's going to be tough and this year could be even tougher i know last year with the big wave that pushed up for bed it made it a little easier for some guys but i'm already under that assumption that i might only get five or seven bites a day in this event you talked about well, something you said right there that has me kind of interested is Santee Cooper Lakes, that's what we call it because there are two lakes, Lake Marion and Lake Moultrie, uh, and a factor that that prevents or allows the second lake, that lower lake, is the water level, possibly. And if it's too low, sometimes you can't get in the certain areas and it's not worth it. Will the field be able to spread out a little bit more? Like, is the water level high enough that it's going to make this place fish a little bit bigger and some the field can disperse for having 103, 104 anglers out there? Or do you think that it's still going to be – you know, heavy, heavy on the upper lake. It, it's borderline. I feel like it's still going to kind of be heavy on the upper lake. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers and it bounces every day. So it's hard to say, but I know a day or two ago when I checked the upper lake, the upper lake was about half a foot higher than when we were here last year. That's a big jump for up there. So that expands that lake more than that lake had shown last year. So that's one, one thing right there. So the upper lake was such a player last year, and now there's even more to that lake for anglers to fish. Obviously, the lower lake has more water in it as well, so I see, I see it going both ways. I could see there still being a huge amount of boats in that upper lake like last year, and I could see that's where it's happening. And then the same thing with the lower lake. You might see boats venture down here, and you know they might get on something down here as well. But, like I said, it's kind of borderline, in my opinion, on the lower lake so far, from what I've seen. I mean, I, I would like it to be, like, flooded, flooded if I'm fishing down here and command to it. Jonathan, obviously, I think uh, you kind of mentioned it. Everybody wants to compare this year's tournament to last year's tournament. But, um, you know, I, I don't think that most people are expecting the same weights as far, as far as the the top end weights. What would be your prediction as far as weights go to win the event and then, obviously, to make the uh, make the cut, 50 cut or 10 cut? 
Uh, I would say 95 to win. Mm, do you happen to know what the cut was last year by chance? I think it was uh I think it was 33 and change. I remember comparing Lake Fork and Santee Cooper from last year to the Lake Murray cut line, which was about the same. So 33 to 34 pounds. Okay, I, I'm thinking it might only take 59 if you're gonna make a 50 cut. Okay. I think you're gonna see the the the, the challenge to stay consistent is gonna be different this year. Last year you seen guys catch a 20 pound bag repeat it. Gets 25, repeat it. This year, you know, I think you're going to see there's going to be 23, 24, 25 pound bags, and then the next day they might have 10, not even a limit, 12 pounds. You never know. So I feel like the later, later you get, as I said, less and less bites you get, harder it is to be consistent. So I think that's going to stagger a lot of the weights. In the end, I probably see maybe three guys running away, you know, with those top three spots. So kind of at the last day, the top. 10 guys, maybe only one, two, or three truly are in contention. Anything could happen on a plate like this because you have a big bag, but I do feel like one, two, three guys will get dialed into something, and and that could just be maybe they pick the region they have it to themselves. Do you think we'll see, you know, we saw a lot of soft plastics, a lot of things like that for the spawning event last time. Do you think we'll see somebody who could possibly lock a top water in their hand for four days and be able to compete weight-wise with it being – a little more post-spawn at times, a little more water, a little more cover in the water maybe, that a top water, whether it's a buzz bait, a frog, walking bait, something like that, be able to factor for somebody for a couple of days in a row because we know top water can be volatile. Yeah, I think I think so. It'll play a lot more this year, the moving baits on top and whatnot. It's just, you know, once you get that true above 70 degrees and you get later and later in the year, the shatter up, the, the brimmer up, all that, it, it, it all factors and do it so i see that being a player i just don't know how well it'll last and it, it all depends from what i've seen with the weather this week it's the weather forecasters aren't too good so far because i've looked three times in the last three days and it's been flip-flopped every single day like i've seen three out of the four tournament days calling for rain and then i checked again this morning and maybe there was barely a shower on one day and then one day is supposed to be really windy. Like it just keeps going up and down, back and forth. So I don't think we're going to know truly what the weather is going to do to dictate a bite yet, like on a certain bait or certain style. I think it's more going to have to be finding fish, getting around the fish, and then kind of just having to adjust throughout the tournament. I really don't see it being only one on one bait or one style of bait, I should say. Jonathan, this is kind of a, a, a tricky or tough question to ask, I guess, because, you know, last year when you looked at it, the guys that had a lot of success were able to catch – you know, big numbers of of females obviously spawning. Um, with the fish potentially being more spread out, do you think it's going to be a deal where, um, you know, your bag is pretty much anchored on your big fish, similar to like lakes in Florida, things like that? Or you think it might be more consistent if guys, you know, find a, a school of them offshore and that kind of thing? I think this one will be more anchored on your big fish. I think a lot of guys last year had the ability to, you know, wrangle up couple of four or five pounders, even a six pounder in a day. I think this year is kind of going to be, you're, you're looking for one to two bites a day between that five to seven, eight pound range. And then you're trying to fill your limit after that. I think that's how it, it'll go a long way. And that kind of, that adds to where I said it's going to be inconsistent. You'll see a 20 pound bag and then fall off the next day or 10 pounds, stuff like that. And that's, it's dictated by, you know, a big bite or two. I think it's going to be a lot harder to catch five, four pounders this time around awesome jonathan we're gonna let you continue fish day one of practice and we'll let you go we appreciate you taking the time uh this isn't your home but it probably feels more like home than other places so good luck this week fishing around familiar territory and uh, keep it up on your great season we saw you higher up in the buckets for fantasy fishing and i know you're wanting to make that bassmaster classic come st lawrence river at the end of the year yeah, I'm going to keep on chucking along, see what we can make happen this one. It is good to be in South Carolina. I do enjoy being down here, that's for sure. Awesome. Jonathan Kelly, Look our guest. View. Oh, go ahead. Yes, it's beautiful. Who is that? Look at that view right there. What's up? I was going to say, who is that? Who's in your territory right now? Do we need to chase them off? I can text them. <laughs> we got a poncho there. We oh, got okay. Jay Shakira over there. <clears throat> Oh, no.
I'm just awesome. out here in no man's land trying to get out of here. So, so I don't hit a stump when I take off. <laughs> yeah, don't fall in with a stump, but uh we'll we'll let you put your phone away be safe and we'll see you hopefully this week on bassmaster live at some point all right sounds like a plan take care guys awesome jonathan kelly our guest on the podcast today kyle and it, it's hard to bracket a tournament beforehand it's really hard to bracket it halfway through a day of practice for jonathan kelly but uh the expectation is nothing but good things from santee cooper when you show up to a big bass factory on times of the year where they should show up, you know, the expectation, it, let's just say it took mid eighties to win in the fall at Santee Cooper. And it took 105 last year to win. I had a hundred percent expected to take in the nineties, just like Jonathan Kelly said, and I'm counting on it to beat Lake Murray's top weight because I had a, a unofficial wager on Bassmaster live saying that it would take more top weight to win, but that the weights through the field would be better at Murray. So we'll see how that plays out. Yeah, it, it is hard to predict, you know, I mean, I, it, naturally, that's kind of our jobs as, as, as pundits is to kind of look at the the scenario and everything and, uh, you know, try to predict what's going to happen. But it's hard to say because Jonathan made a great point there. I think the thing that I keep thinking of is the fact that, you know, the tournament last year was pretty significantly earlier than this, obviously still in March. And that was what seemed to be the biggest wave of the spawn all year long. So like Jonathan mentioned, uh, with the amount of fish that probably spawned similar time frame this year, I mean, those fish are a month removed from uh, from spawning. So, I mean, they're pretty much straight up post-spawn, past the post-spawn funk and everything. But um, at the end of the day, you still look at it on a place like Santee Cooper with such a rich vegetation of, you know, habitat being um, you know, of course, grass, but the cypress trees, the hardcover uh, docks, things of that nature. Hard to believe that at the end of April, there's not going to be plenty of fish still shallow uh, to be caught some way. Like you mentioned, top water, um, you know, flipping, you know, who knows, swimming a jig, who knows what it's going to be. Um, and I think that's what makes it hard to predict because, you know, like you mentioned, the fall tournament is basically a wash for, you know, figuring out who's going to do well or what's going to play. Um, and then last year was so much earlier uh, and the spawn was just full on happening that it was like, it's hard to really use that, you know, uh, for something this year. Cause you don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we're sitting there on day three of the tournament and everybody in the top 10 is fishing offshore. And I also wouldn't be surprised if, you know, half or more of them are still fishing up shallow. So, I mean, it's really hard to predict. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, and I don't have the dates of last year's event in front of me, but I remember we had the classic March 6th through the 9th at Hartwell. We had the next few days of that week off, you know, the next week. And then we were back at Santee Cooper, and then my daughter was born like on day one, or not, not on day one. We were still in the hospital on day one. She was born just before the event started. So around that March 15th time period was the week of the event. 17. Now, 17th through the 21st. I just happen to already have it up. Yeah. So the 17th through the 21st, we even had a weather delay in there and he, we ended on a, on a Monday, but it was like 45 days ago from like right now, you know, if it was, so the big difference is we had a late classic this year. And when, then we had three weeks before we started the next elite, whereas last year we had the classic early in March and we had like no gap and was straight into the elite series again. And uh, I'm just going to say that's why Je that's why Jason Christie finished next to last at Santee Cooper uncharacteristically. He had no time to uh, get his mind back on the elites. No excuses there for him. He would probably make no excuses, but I'm going to make that excuse for him that, that that's why the, the quick turnaround. But yeah, such a, a farther along process. And I mentioned it, Lake Eufaula in Alabama was right after Lake Seminole elite event. And that was the first week of March. And it was 70 degree water in places. And there was only like 30 fish up on the bed because it happened so fast. That water temperature skyrocketed and the fish could not catch up to it ahead, uh, you know. And that's what a couple of anglers said when we interviewed them about how they were catching. They said, I just feel like we're fishing ahead of the fish. Like the weather is ahead of them where it says it's spawn time, but these fish aren't up there yet. They're all offshore. And that's how it was won. I feel like at Santee Cooper and places like that, it got warm and then we've had the normal cool down and now it's finally getting in the 75 to 80 range every day, but the lows are in the mid fifties, things like that. And so 
With Jonathan Kelly saying the water temps in 70 degrees on Monday morning for this event, I'd expect it to be more and more post-spawn or a late wave of spawners that we end up seeing show up later in the week. But weather is something we need to watch. There is going to be some rain. It looks like, at least on my radar, Friday was was the rain, but it could get moved up. Um, well, let's jump in, Kyle, to Rappel of Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing Picks and our Mercury Drain the Lake Picks. Looking back at Lake Murray, I had uh, one guy make the top 10 from my Rapala team. I had two make the bottom 20 on my Rapala team. And then I had two inside the cut line. So I had three out of the five get paid, but those two at the bottom really hurt my top end score because they just took away any good work that we did with our top 10 guys. So that was brutal for me. And then I had over 2,100 points for Drain the Lake because I had four in the top 10. I had another two make the cut. And then I only had two miss the cut and they were in the 70, 80 range, not in the 90 or 100. So pretty solid. And I'm hoping to turn that into better mojo at Santee Cooper this week. We need another good one. We need to, we need to wrap back to back together. Yeah, no question. And and to, to your credit, the, the same two that you had in the bottom 10 were the same two I had in the bottom 10 as well. Um, so that made it a little difficult, but. Uh, in Rapala, I had two guys make 36, and then Drain the Lake, I think I was pretty pretty middle of the road, if I remember correctly. Uh, I'm sitting about the same as you are as far as the uh, season total is concerned. But, uh, yeah, I had – let's see here. Why is this not updating? Um, I had three guys in the top ten as well uh, going into – the final day so uh also had some some duds there too though so uh like you said we need to we need to we need to get rid of the duds and and just keep the guys in the top 10 and we should be all right yeah i uh got those bonus points doubling the points and drain the lake when drew benton had that last call to win the event big time for him big time for me if we're being selfish over here but yeah uh, I think we're both, I jumped from like 60% to 85% and drain the lake. So we're back, baby. And I'm only going to cut it down more this week. So let's get into our Rappala Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing Picks though. Um, can you go ahead and give me your A through E picks and then I'll go and then we'll hop into drain the lake. I certainly can. Uh, in complete transparency, I picked these picks last night. Um, so if if you've made the picks like the night after the last day of a tournament you go through there and they don't have any percentages the percentages update the next morning uh i did that intentionally because i don't want to pay attention to the percentages I, i've looked at them since i've paid attention to them this morning um but in my head i was like i'm just gonna pick five guys that i think are gonna catch them and whatever the percentages lay out they lay out because at this point i'm i'm not doing great in rapala either so uh i'm just looking for a little positivity here so bucket a I'm going chalk as chalk gets. I'm going Patrick Walters and Bucket A. I think the momentum um, is bigger than anything. I mean, I think that, you know, last year when you were talking about him you know, going into San or Santee, I mean, I think there was um, a little bit of letdown maybe from the classic. Obviously, he didn't do bad, didn't do bad there whatsoever, but um, I think he definitely wanted to do better there. Um, I think the positive momentum is good. I mean, obviously, a top 10 at Murray where he's super familiar. Um, I think that, you know, we could probably expect to see the same thing. And and Jonathan mentioning the live scope thing gives me that much more confidence just because if there is something to be found offshore, a little like sneaky, there's a few guys in the field that I think would find them, and Patrick Walters is one of them. Uh, bucket B, I'm going Luke Palmer. So Luke obviously did well there last year. Um, wasn't necessarily like sight fishing. That's what gives me a lot of hope. Some of my picks are guys that were, you know, had success last year, but didn't weren't necessarily sight fishing. Uh, Luke was doing a lot of a flipping of trees. Some of the fish he was seeing on live scope that were probably on beds. But um, I think that Luke Palmer, no matter the way this turns out, I mean, if it's a live scope thing, could do well. I think that if it's a shallow top water, grind it out deal, could do well. Um, I just went and looked at a statistic. Luke Palmer in his time in the Elite Series has never finished outside of the 50 cut two tournaments in a row. It's never happened. He's never finished outside of the 50 cut two tournaments in a row. Finished one spot out of the 50 cut at Lake Murray. I got him bouncing back in there, baby. He's he's going to have a good event. Uh, bucket C, I'm going West Logan. 
Morgan. I, I kind of I, I kind of felt this pick was going to happen no matter what uh, bucket he was in. I, I just like the the thought of it being a Chad Spawn type tournament, something where you can really capitalize early. I think that um, you know something you and I talked about before we started the podcast was I've got a lot of confidence in some of the Coosa River guys to be able to find that Chad's bond because that's something they're so familiar with. They're also good at it. Um, not to say that other guys aren't as well, but um, Wes Logan also had a good event there last year. Uh, I would expect him to have another solid showing. Uh, Bucket D got Todd Otten. Uh, same, same general reason. I think that he'll be able to figure out some way to catch him, uh, move and bait, uh, whatever that may be. Um South Carolina guy, of course, uh, did did well there last year. Had a good event at um, at Murray. I want to say made the cut. So I'm going Todd Otten and Bucket D. I actually went with Todd Otten last year at Santee Cooper. So we're just trying to you know catch lightning in a bottle two two years in a row. Um, Bucket E for the same reason that I think West Logan will do well. I'm going with Matt Heron, and I don't know why, but it seems like this happens a lot. It seems like every time I pick one, I pick the other. Uh, it's just not by design. It's just like if mentally I think that one of them is going to do well, they fish so similar that it's like, well, I could see him doing well, uh, you know, as well. And uh, Matt Heron obviously didn't have a great event at Murray at all. Um, I think he's going to be mad at him, and I think it's going to set up to his style to be able to, you know, power fish shallow. Whether or not that's what it's going to take to win, I think that once again, like we mentioned, I think there's going to be enough fish shallow, giving that it or given that it's still April. Um, you know, to be able to, to, you know, make a 50 cut there. So that's what I got. I got Patrick Walters, Luke Palmer, Wes Logan, Todd Otten, and Matt Heron. You mentioned Matt Heron, Matt Heron's X factor is that he could be mad at him, but we're just, just to be clear, just to be clear and clarify this matter than normal at them because he's always mad at them. It seems so, uh, that's for t-bone matt heron i just wanted to provide some some laughter there for him being a bucket e uh he's always a fierce competitor as we've seen uh my five picks luckily none of them match he's in the you. box too yeah he's he's in our box for sure the we've <laughs> we've got uh last week we had three of our rapala guys match up and only one of them was successful this week, zero of our team matches, so I'm very confident that I'm totally going to get screwed this week and do poor all, all together. Um, but starting out in bucket A, I'm going with Matt Airy. Man, obviously he's fished well this year being in bucket A. But one thing I love about Matt is that he normally never catches the big ones. Like, he's always just a real consistent guy. This year he had an 8-1 at Seminole. He had a 7-11 at uh, Lake Murray. I think Airy is a, is – either putting himself in good positions. I don't think he's specifically trying to seek out the big bass of the tournament, but he is putting himself in good positions. He fishes well around this transition from the spawn, uh, like the immediate, you know, immediate pre-spawn to the spawn to the immediate post-spawn. He does really well this time of the year, I feel. And then when those fish do get in that offshore funk of they're wanting to make a move out, they haven't necessarily, I feel like he's one that definitely, hits them on the highway. So Matt Aries, my bucket A pick. And I didn't really look at percentages either, even though there's percentages lifted listed on Monday when I picked them. I didn't look at percentages really. I just, uh, I didn't want to go super chalk. I, not saying I don't think Patrick Walters is going to catch him. I definitely think he will. And I definitely think he has more of an advantage in this Santee Cooper event than he did in last year's Santee Cooper event with it more, more spawning fish there it takes your advantage away. I think he's definitely got more of an advantage now. Um, my bucket B pick. Now, I think it's just because he's really good at fishing a lot of different ways. He's proven that the first two years in the Elite Series. But I don't really think he has a shad spawn back home. I don't think that he's, you know, there's guys in that Minnesota and Wisconsin region that just don't necessarily see a shad spawn as frequently as the Southern guys do. Uh, but that is Jay Shakurit. I think Jay Shakurit is a great Southern angler from from based on where he comes from. I think that, that he's a rock salt we think about the bob downies the caleb ku falls the pat Schloppers. a lot of those guys found really good success at santee cooper and i think that jay could do the same thing this year whether it is up in the grass whether it's the cypress trees whether it's a shad spawn whether it's bed fishing whatever it is i really like jay in this one bucket c i'm going with john cruz uh looking through this bucket there's names like fighter 
Uh, you've got Gussie. You've got a lot of Northern guys, Hartman, Johnston, um, guys like that in here. You've got Bill Lowen, Brandon Polinick, Clifford Perch. Listing out the rest of them, you know, Jacob Prozden could be one, Matt Robertson. But I really didn't look at anybody and was like, man, this is up their alley. Like, I couldn't. I couldn't put a finger on bucket C necessarily. And so I really feel comfortable with John Cruz. Um, He always starts the year really strong in angler of the year. You know, he's always doing well in the pre-spawn or those Florida spawn events, but that didn't necessarily translate this year. And he didn't do too hot at Murray, but I do think uh, we won't see him miss the cut twice in a row. I think that he'll be able to get back in the game this week and bucket C he's right there in the middle of those guys who are just inside or just outside that classic cut right there. And so I'd expect John to have an uptick in production this week. Uh, bucket D is specifically because this guy needs a good one. You know, Brock Mosley wore that shirt last year that said, I need a top 10, need a top 10. This guy needs not necessarily a top 10, but he would love one. And because of the, possibility of more offshore grass like eel grass and things like that i am looking at buddy gross i think that the farther we get from the spawn the better buddy gross gets whether it's the pre-spawn and the cold cold water or the post-spawn and that summertime feel to it i feel like we could have a better buddy gross than what we've seen in the last few events kind of been thrown for a loop on how these fish have acted at seminole he didn't do well um the classic wasn't the best for him, and he was down in the dumps after Murray. He needs a good one, and I feel like this could be a good one for Buddy Gross um, in bucket D. Percentages, obviously, I wasn't paying attention to him, but you got Jason Christie in that bucket, Caleb Kufa in that bucket. Christie speaks for himself, even though he didn't do well here last year. This is kind of a revenge tour for him, so to say. Caleb Kufal did do well last year, getting second place here. Those two take up about 50% of that bucket for bucket D. So I could see why everyone else would have a lower percentage. So I'm not taking too much grain of salt. I'm taking it with a grain of salt there. Bucket E, I'm going to go with a new face. Looking through bucket E, we could say this every single event, but these are the guys who have not caught them. And now we're to the point in the season where we're a third of the way through the season. This is time where you need to start catching them in the next few events. If you want to make a shot, you don't want to get your hole dug too far for the classic. So I think Kyle Norsetter, um, if you don't know much about him, he qualified through the Central Opens last year, uh, fishing Rayburn, I think the Red River and Ross Barnett. I think that those styles of lakes suit him well. He's from Wisconsin. Um, he was planning on fishing all nine this year if he didn't make the Elite Series, so I know he's committed to it. I know that he's trying to take it in his first year in the Elite Series, but I also know he's a super competitive person. I feel like with a bladed jig, swim jig, flipping, I feel like this is one where you can do those things just fishing and you don't have to be on a pattern necessarily. Like Jonathan Kelly said, he's kind of caught four fish doing kind of a couple different things and hasn't dialed it in yet. I think if you don't dial it in, I think that too many times we look for someone to dial in a specific pattern rather than just going fishing. And I feel like this is going to be a great just going fishing event because even though that shad spawn may happen, the low temps each night are in the fifties. Um, we have a little bit of stormy stuff. There, it could be prolonged. It could not be as strong because of those 50 degree nights. I would love to see lows in the 60s for sure to make sure that shad spawn continues to to get stronger on that. But I feel like if you're just fishing, Kyle Norsetter could be a good one. If you aren't quite sure who to pick, we've got some old school guys in here. We've got some northern guys in here. We've got some really big names that have underperformed this year that they've got to turn it around. So I don't I don't doubt people for picking a Brian New or things like that. Um, Keith Poche will be fishing with the Bassmaster Lead Series of Santee Cooper, so I know he'll he'll take up some percentage because the one event he has fished this year, he uh, elite wise, he did make the cut. So we'll see how that goes in Bucket E. But those are my picks for Rappel of Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing: Matt Airy, Jay Shakurit, John Cruz, Buddy Gross, and Kyle Norsetter. Um, I feel I'm feeling okay about that. It's kind of a a little variety there, but I do feel confident in that. I got my winning weight around 90, 91 pounds. So not not 95, but somewhere in that 90 range, low 90s, I feel like uh, could get it done. Kyle, do you want me to jump in and do my first four for the drain the lake portion? Or do you want to uh, do you want to throw your first four out? Um, I'll do my first four and only because 
I started smiling there towards the end. You want me to copy you? Were... I under... You want me to copy? No, you. no, 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 no. <laughs> because a couple of your Rapala picks are my drain the lake picks for the same exact reasons that you selected them. Um, so I'll start with my first four just to double up a couple of the guys that you already picked in Rapala. Um, so I also have Buddy Gross and John Cruz for the same reason. I don't know why, but I, I think it was you that made the comment maybe on Bass Live or I don't know. Uh, about Kyle Austin saying that um, it's possible it could be one on like offshore stumps and offshore, um, you know, pieces of, of cover. Uh, that's just Buddy Gross. I mean, Buddy Gross, anything offshore. And then you mentioned eelgrass. I mean, everything seems like it, it it's a really good chance for Buddy Gross to have a good event here. Obviously, we don't have a traditional like ledge fishing tournament on the schedule this year. Um, I like Buddy Gross a lot. John Cruz, same way. I mean, you, you, maybe not for the same reasons as Buddy Gross, but you know, you mentioning being able to just go fishing. And it seems like anytime John Cruz just goes fishing on a place that has big ones, uh, typically works out pretty well. Uh, then I've got Jacob Brosnick, obviously did well here last year. I think he'll be one of those guys that can, you know, still find those fish up shallow fish, excuse me. Um, you know, wacky worm, things of that nature, just fishing around. Uh, for the same exact reason to round out my first four, I've got Bill Lowe. And I think Bill Lowe needs to have a good event. I think that it not being just a straight up sight fishing event, uh, but an event where, you know, shallow junk fishing will play. Uh, I think Bill Owen will do a good one as, or have a good one as well. So to give you my first four again, I've got Bill Owen, John Cruz, Buddy Gross, and Jacob Perosnik. Well, a couple of my Rapala do duplicate in my Drain the Lake Remember, I set my drain the lake when the season before the season started. I picked all all eight anglers for every event ahead of time. So there could be guys who are doing worse than we thought they would. And people would be like, why are you picking them? They're in a slump. Well, I picked it all before. It works out for me most of the time, just thinking about the patterns, the styles overall, and allocating anglers to it. So uh, you'll a couple of these picks, you'll be like, oh, that makes sense now that we see what stage these fish are in. Well, I kind of thought about it beforehand. Um, but the couple that duplicate, I got John Cruz and Jay Shakurit on my Drain the Lake team, just like I had him on Rapala. You said Bill Lowen. I've got Bill Lowen as well. And then I've got Steve Kennedy. So I've got Steve Kennedy here. He's had a lot of good experience here. I said in the live well that water level would be an X factor. At times we've been there, it's been lower. And we haven't seen Lake Moultrie really factor that much, that lower lake. With that water being a little higher, I feel like we could have some guys go poking around and explore and find some stuff. And Kennedy's definitely a poker, somebody who's going to explore around and try to get on something different, fish away from people. He doesn't like fishing in crowds. I think that that water being a little high, as long as they're not bringing it down or it's not changing too much. If it's going to be a foot or a foot or half a foot high, just keep it there and uh, and we could see some diversity come into play. So those first four, John Cruz, Bill Lowen. Jay Shakira and Steve Kennedy. Give me your uh, last four. Last four. I have got Patrick Walters, which I was really nervous about not using him at Murray because naturally you want to, you know, you and I've talked about this. You want to pick a guy for drain the lake on the event that you think he has the best chance to win because the, the double and triple points, obviously triple for the classic uh, are so big that when you get them, it, it makes a huge difference. So um, I was really nervous about not using Walters at Murray because it was looking like he was going to be the guy, but uh, I saved him for Santee Cooper. I think the, I think that if we keep coming here, eventually one of these times is going to line up. And it's the same way that we always talk about, you know, G-Man at Gunnersville. Like eventually everything's going to line up to where like having that local advantage is going to help tremendously. So I've got Patrick Walters, Clark Wendelet, Luke Palmer, and Caleb Kufall. Uh Caleb Kufal is another one of those guys, you know, had a bad event at Murray. Um, what gives me a lot of confidence is the fact that once again, I mentioned this earlier, he's one of the guys that did really well here last year, but it was not fishing for sight fish. It was just fishing shallow, just flipping a jig, doing what he does best. And I think that um, even given the circumstances, I think that Caleb will be able to, you know, duplicate something to that nature, um, you know, flipping, whether it be a jig or soft plastic, but um but yeah, I've got Patrick Walters, Clark. Yeah, uh, the, uh, gonna the mouse the trap. Bit. Give him the mouse it's, trap. It's one of the few places he can't really. He mentioned this last year that he can't do the mouse trap all, all the time because the fish are too big for it. But uh, but yeah, I got Caleb Kufal, Luke Palmer, Clark Wendelet, and Patrick Walters rounding out my drain the lake roster. I like that, and I even considered Clark Wendelet because he was just 
even even if I wasn't really keying in on percentages, I was considering him in Rapala because 0.2% for a guy who's good around the spawn and sight fish, uh, it faded on him well, at yeah, it faded yeah. on him at uh, uh, Murray the sight fish stuff, but um, yeah, he was one that I thought about. My final four be interesting. I've used this guy quite a bit this year, but most of it was obviously in Rapala, and now I'm finally using him in Drain the Lake. Kyle Welcher. Man, if this is a just fishing tournament, I feel like Kyle Welcher could throw himself a frog, throw himself a swim jig. Uh-oh, I'm going to crank some riprap. Uh, I'll I'll pick up a, a forward-facing sonar bait around some standing timber, whatever. I'll go fish in the swamp. Um, Kyle Welcher's one that I have for my final four. Jason Christie, and I am purely picked it because it is later in the year, and you do not want to make Jason Christie mad because the next time he has the chance to one-up you, he's going to. And so the lake has made Jason Christie mad. And the next time we go there, it lines up better for his style, I believe. But man, this time going there, I really expect him to catch him. So Kyle Welcher, Jason Christie. And then my last two, I'm going two rookies. You kind of don't know when you need to use rookies sometimes on the drain the lake. But I'm going to burn two rookies this week. David Gaston and John Suckup. Um, John... Thought we'd have a better season so far from him. I'd expect this one, Lay Lake and Sabine, to for him to start to gain some steam. Um, I did not want to use Coosa River, David Gaston at Lay Lake because, like we said at Murray, there was 13 Carolinians. You didn't, you couldn't use them all. You got to figure out who you're going to use. I almost don't want that many to be available to me for Drain the Lake at Lay Lake. So I had to use a couple beforehand or afterwards. And so David Gaston, he's fishing really well right now. If Kyoya Fujita and wasn't two top threes and Joey Sefuentes didn't have a victory, David Gaston is one that we would be echoing. So kudos to you for, for picking him as your early rookie of the year. We'll see how he does up north. But so far through three events, big time kudos to David Gaston. So my last four, Kyle Welcher, Jason Christie, David Gaston, and John Sokup, um, overall, Welcher, Christie, Gaston, Sokup, Cruz, Lowen, Shakirat, and Kennedy. So um, I feel like that's a pretty diverse group. I feel like I still have some hammers, even though I might have burned some at Seminole and stuff, which I did not do because I was struggling. I had already pre-planned them. It just didn't work out for me. So I would use Buddy Gross this week, but you know I already burned them at Seminole. So whatever. Yeah, I uh, I'm looking forward to this one, seeing how it plays out. I think that Honestly, it's almost kind of fun with these tournaments where you're really not sure which way it's going to go. Um, I fully expect, based on time of the year and everything and what we just saw at Murray, obviously the lakes are so separately you know, different, but um, the fact that we saw so many things play out, I think that we can expect to see that again. I think we'll see a lot of different patterns, a lot of different things going on. And I think that those fish being potentially, you know, mostly post-spawned, presents a lot more opportunities because once again there's still going to be a lot of guys catch from shallow whether they're actively spawning they're tri guarding their shad you know targeting chad spawn um, even a bluegill spawn like john cox found something like that um i think that you know guys will still catch them that way which provides a lot of opportunity there and it also provides opportunity because like jonathan kelly said um there's a lot of these fish that have probably been postponed for a month or more um and you know might and be completely pretty again off yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's going to provide a lot of opportunity, I hope for our anglers. And I'm, I'm super, super excited to see how this one plays out. You know, that even in Florida and they have spawns that start in Thanksgiving, Christmas time, and then they still have spawns that go through May. And so the same can be said for Santee Cooper. Yeah. Maybe not the 10 pounders pulling up, but we could still see those pretty pre-spawners coming into spawn as well. One thing I like about this is the temperatures have stabilized those, those highs are there. We had big cold fronts last year coming into the event, and then all of a sudden it got warm, and those spawning fish were ready to go. This year, a guy could go and buzz a frog or throw a, a dipper or a swim jig through a pad field and have some blow-ups from some spawners, and then you realize that they're spawning in this pad field. Let me flip this. Um, but you could just go fishing and figure out something going on. So, um, you know, I remember just seeing Drew Cook just pulled down in a pad field, and he had bed fish wherever he wanted them. So... I feel like those same places will be used, but they're not just by fish spawning. So should be a good event. Santee Cooper, the Aftco Bassmaster Elite. That starts up later this week. 
April 27th through the 30th, I believe, 27, 28, 29, 30. Yeah, April 27th through the 30th, the AFCO Bassmaster Elite at Santee Cooper. Excited to see that go down. We had some good service for Bassmaster Live. And, man, coming off such a great week at Lake Murray, I know this one's going to be good. So for episode 120, 123, easy for me to say, of the Bassmaster Podcast presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company, I'm Ronnie Moore. That's Kyle Jesse, and we will see you next week to preview the next stop of the Opens. There's no rest for the weary. The Elite Series goes straight into the Opens, the Opens. Then we then we have a little bit of a break. We'll have, we'll have some little gaps of break. So we'll keep you guys all abreast on what's going on in the fishing world for Bassmaster tournaments and more here on the Inside Bassmaster podcast. We'll see you in the next one.